All right. So, um, news from this week. Uh, let's just uh, get started with last Sunday after our live stream. Uh, we brewed a Stein beer. One of the most epic beers that we have <laughs> brewed in a long time, and it was so much fun. We did do it all on video. I'm super excited for you. And there's a surprise with how we brewed it that we're, we think we're pretty clever in looking at. Yes, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Stein beer, uh, it is a beer brewed with rocks instead of, well normal like propane like fire and or electricity yeah uh, and uh the rocks that we use are uh were found rocks rather than rocks that are specifically sought out and purchased for the uh reason of making a stein beer you know you gotta you gotta use rocks that you yeah. got and we did it old world style where we put those rocks right in the coals whereas a lot of people brewing stein beers today will actually put a mesh like a metal mesh screen over the fire and it actually cook the rocks on top of it to reduce the soot Damn. stein beers had soot in them guys so we did it and it Did was great. It. Yeah. Um, yeah, beer actually, as of yesterday, was tasting pretty damn good. Yep. And uh, so look forward to that video coming your way in another maybe week or two. And uh, so other than that, uh, let's see. What are we talking about? Trying to improve formats of our videos. Um, getting getting some more fun stuff out there. Yeah, trying to improve yeah, the formats in the videos. As for new beers of the week, we have a, uh, well, on top of the Stein beer, we also have a rye lager that we brewed a, another batch of. Actually, this is our second batch of that. Um, and then also a sort of oatmeal cookie stout that I believe we talked about um, some naked oats that we had in at some point in one of our previous streams. And uh, so, yeah, we got those in a sort of oatmeal stout cookie beer. And someone said that we got audio in only one year. I'm looking at our OBS, and that seems to be correct. So let me see if I can fix that. Well, we, we'll keep going, but uh, I just wanted to mention, if you got audio in only one year, I'm hopefully about to fix that. Oh, yeah, it's probably because of our did issues I click this, with audio. Did I click this mono? Would that change it? Um, yeah, yes, that changes that it. That should Sweet. change it, yep. All right, let me know if that helps, and if you now have uh, audio in both ears. Okay, and so, yeah, that is – is that it for our news for the week? Um, Brew to Stein beer. What, did, we, did we put some beers on tap or something like that? We got yeah. a glycol chiller in. Got, oh, yeah, we did finally get the glycol chiller in. So we got a little tiny uh, baby glycol chiller, the Brew Ma – or what is it? Brew Builds Ice Master Max 4. Um, pretty much brand new to the market as far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. um, I actually looked it up, some of the specs on more beer yesterday, and like there's zero reviews on it yet. So, Well, we are about to be the first ones to do that soon. Yeah, so really cool um, little thing. Price point of like 900 bucks, and you can run four different type of fermenters and or bright tanks off of it. So on a small scale, pretty pretty cool thing, pretty kick-butt price point. So. Yeah, and we're excited to use it because it should be perfect for a lot of the sizes we do. We do a lot of one and hopefully going to go up to a two-barrel uh option pretty soon and that can run up to four two barrel tanks so perfect for us yep um yeah so that's it other than you know daylight savings time yeah <laughs> logan logan got here at the last minute and then we had audio issues and i was like ah i ran to walmart while he found the piece that we were missing here uh, and then, so uh, yeah it was we a fun little morning adventure made it work um <laughs> so yeah let's just go right on to <clears throat> our beer of the week beer of the week yeah um which is going to be a scottish light ale which I'm going to actually have to grab my phone because I never did research this like I was supposed to. Yeah, yeah. Someone went home and was like, hey, by the way, we're going to work on some stuff and uh, we'll, we'll do some research on these. Scottish Light Ale, let's do a beer that we haven't uh, been super familiar with before because we can totally research it between yesterday and today. Nah, we didn't, uh, we didn't research it. BJCP. Well, d you know what? You know, we can uh, we can move on to the hops and malts of the week real quick and then I'll just go ahead and put BJCP. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Scottish. Yeah. Um, light oh, ale well, well, he's up on the screen that, actually, i will show you another new thing of the week is this going to be the most hectic uh start to a live stream ever scottish light <laughs> perfect 14a is the category style and i have the ability to display capture that's probably really loud but you know cool stuff and stuff so and they're finally done they got inserts in them Perfect. Display capture. We're going to go ahead and still put us up top there. But yeah, lots of uh, tappy handles now. Make us small on the side, and then we'll go ahead and jump on over to the BJCP category for Scottish Light Ale. So, yeah, we did read through this briefly, and uh, this is sort of the Scottish ale that uh, nobody actually knows about, and yet 
probably should be brewed more. Yeah, so uh, first and foremost, the thing that kind of struck us when we were looking at this is if you look at the ABV, it's 2.5 to 3.2. That's as low as any Goza or any you know, yeah. traditionally historically light beer that I've seen. But what they, uh, what they tout, the thing that makes a Scottish light ale different, I guess it's kind of in the same wheelhouse as a mild ale should be, but it's uh, f- teeming with robust flavors. It's got a lot of sweetness. Uh, obviously, with any Scotch ale, you've got the fruitiness from the yeast that's going to come off, uh, and you really have to work hard to make sure you're pumping as much great malt flavor into that as possible with such a small body. Yep. So one of the things that they also mention, if you read through the description, is that uh, this should not be smoky at all. And this actually is, is sort of a thing that goes for a lot of different scotch ales. Everybody thinks that you have to <clears throat> throw a whole bunch of peat and malt into a scotch ale to make it a scotch. Uh, and that's really not, not true. Yeah, you know, Scottish ales traditionally, uh, for the most part, don't have any uh, peat malt. is actually inappropriate. People uh, confuse scotch, the whiskey, with scotch ale. And honestly, even scotch, the whiskey, isn't always peated. That's just if you're using like an Islay-style scotch or like one of the more you know seaweedy, nice peat-smoked scotches. But Highland scotches, those are the bourbons of the scotch world. And that's kind of uh, that kind of sweetness is the same kind of reminiscence that you might think of when you think of a Scottish light. Yep. So as for uh, Scottish Light 2, um, I think the other thing is that um, the yeast, um, obviously using that yeast, you're, you're letting that yeast shine. You're, you're keeping the um, grain bill on this style of beer pretty simple and letting some of the characteristics that, uh, that the old uh, you know, 1728 from Y yeast is going to throw for you. Yeah. Or the uh, tartan, right, from uh, Imperial. So let's talk strategies for getting all that malt flavor into a scotch ale. And I think the thing that you really got to start with is a very flavorful and full-bodied base malt. Bringing us to our malt of the week. Dun, dun, malt of the week. And that is Golden Promise. Uh, Golden Promise is a pretty robust flavored base malt. I like to always describe it as being a very sweet malt to begin with. Um, still pretty light in color from what I know, though. He's just going to pull up the exact stats so that I'm not, like, full of, full of crap right now. But um, uh, Yeah, it should be around the same as, like, Marisotter as far uh, as I oh yeah. know. Oh, 1.1. Fame. 1.1L. Oh, wow. Yeah, so super, super light color, actually. Even lighter than I expected. I expected it to be right around 2. Yeah, but, that's, uh, um, that's crazy. But despite the light color, still has um, a, lot of, a lot of really kind of rich sweetness quality to it. Um, if I were to try to compare it to... Any other malt, it's it's almost like um, if you have sort of like their the Maris Otter 1823, but instead of the nuttiness, um, having almost a honey-like characteristic to the finish. That's got to be wrong because it says the EBC is between four and six. So that's okay, definitely that a Maris makes, Otter That makes range. more sense. Yeah, so whatever I just pulled up on more beer, that was definitely wrong. Okay. <laughs> so you're looking in that Maris Otter range of darkness, so still very you know sturdy and full-bodied malt. Um, on Simpson's website, they say theirs is when you need a high-performing, well-balanced malt to complement your big hops. Look no further than Golden Promise. That's a great commercial start. Um, <laughs> good mouthfeel uh, t- with even the gustiest of hops. I like how they're trying to do that hop balance kind of thing. Yep. Um, yeah, if you're using a session beer, you won't lose out on body. And I think that's kind of the what you're going for with something like a Scottish Light Ale. You need to have enough back there to really fill out the space when you only have 3.2% to work with. Yep. So, and then on top of that, we are going to want to throw quite a few adjuncts just because the beer itself is going to be so small, right? So yeah. This is, the, this is the one occasion, well, maybe two occasions, where I actually say, yes, break out your crystal malts, even though we have a uh, loathing relationship for them. Um, but what I would actually recommend is instead of um, loading up on, say, a medium crystal um, at the rate of, you know, a pound and a half or two pounds for this beer, um, I would actually really recommend breaking that down, um, doing... Um, say maybe you know a half pound of like a, a lighter crystal say 15 or 20 uh, lova bond and then going you know maybe another f- half pound six ounces somewhere of, a, of more of a medium crystal and then another um, equal that much of a darker crystal to really get that sort of balance of all those different malt characters and we even got a fun new darker crystal in that we won't talk too much about today because we'll save it for another malt of the week. But it is a Simpsons double roasted crystal. It sounds like Simpsons might be a good uh, oh, yeah. malt story go, to, yeah. to work with on this kind of style. Yeah, and then on top of that, um, if you do want to use some of those crystal adjacent malts like we've talked about in <coughs> other videos, um, things that are sort of a, a blend between a crystal malt and a biscuit malt, those special would all X. Yeah, those would also fit very well in a style like this, something like Special X. Um, is a pretty high color one, so you probably don't want to get too crazy with that. 
um, avoid too much of that roastiness, but uh, 100% special X. Yeah, 100%. Get yeah. it, girl. <laughs> Um, but yeah, definitely don't be afraid to use those. Um, don't be used as, uh, like, um, Kerasteem is another one that sort of comes to my mind. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that is, um, the malt talking about for Scottish Light Ale. Let's go on to the hop of the week. Um, and that is going to be Challenger. And, uh, Challenger is just sort of, a an understated hop in my experience, but, uh, it's, it works really well for, um, any of those beers that you really want to get that that nice floral balance to. It's not going to be generally as pungent as something like East Kent Golding, um, but gives you just a good balance in a beer that really isn't designed to be uh, hop forward. Yeah, it's so basically it's a it's a really good uh, all dual purpose, but mostly used for bittering English style hop. Uh, you can substitute it anywhere you'd use if you're using Target for your bittering hop or any of those. You know, even if you're using Northern Brewer, which is a more flavorful hop, mm -hmm. um, Challenger can be substituted if it's on the bittering end. If you use it on the back end, you do get a little bit of spiciness. I think a lot of those kind of classic English-style hops give you some spiciness. Yeah. Um, but it's not going to be a, a, an overwhelming, you know, that earthy spiciness that you get off of a Fuggles or a Kent Golden. Yeah. And so it could be a good more neutral, maybe if you're doing a pale ale, like an English-style pale ale, yeah. dual-purpose hop there. And generally, <laughs> I think, like, the herbal character gens. Uh, generally tends to lend in well um, with some of the sweeter malts, some of those sweeter um, specialty grains that we're going to be throwing into a beer like a Scottish Light Ale. So Yeah, and right in the medium in terms of the cohumulone, so don't worry too much about cobite, but it, it is there more so than like something, you know, a lot of the New World hops that are bred for low cohumulone. Bam. Well, let's talk about our yeast. I think I already mentioned it, but uh, yeah, so the yeast of the week is going to be tartan. Tartan. And that is uh, from Imperial. Um, like I mentioned before, the other the other same yeast would be the um, 1728 from Y yeast. Um, but this strain really does a nice job throwing a, a rounder, sweeter malt forward profile while still having... Um, some nice sort of fruity esters and, and that sort of classic butterscotchy character that you're going to get from Scotch Ales. Yep, uh, it's definitely one of the ones that uh, it has a weird temperature range, but if you ferment it on the cold end, you can get something relatively crisp, but you're always going to get a little bit of that pseudo smokiness, um, uh, pseudo fruitiness off of it from the low temperature end. Uh, and tartan actually can go down to like 55, 56 degrees. Yep. They don't recommend it with Imperial's yeast, but if you look at something like a Y yeast analog, you will see them say, hey, this can go down to 55, and you can make a pretty clean beer, but you really got to uh, rouse it a little bit to make sure that it's going to get its job done. And then on that warmer end, that classic, you know, 68 to 72, you definitely start pushing forward a lot of that fruity character. Yep. Yeah, and also to note on the cold end, um, you definitely, because this is a strain that <laughs> does produce diacetyl, one of the few out there, um, so if you are fermenting on the low end, definitely make sure that you either give it a good long VDK rest and or um, bump that temp up to, you know, closer to 70 degrees for at least a few days, if not even the better part of a week, um, just to kind of clean up some of that diacetyl in the end. Oh, yeah. Um, otherwise, you end up with butterscotch beer. Um, yum. The wrong kind of butter beer. All right. Well, I think that sums up our beer of the week. Let's just go right into our main categories today. So uh, let's go ahead and start with strategies for high ABV beers now that we just talked about a very low, low ABV, ABV beer. beer. Yeah, so before we get too much into this, if you guys have any experiences with high ABV beers that you want to share, leave them in the comments or whatever the chat box is that you call on the right, the live chat. Um, but uh, our strategies for AB high ABV beers almost always rely on a long boil time. Yeah, the boil is going to um, create Maillard reactions, create more <coughs> flavor complexity, but most of all is going to allow you to get uh, more wort volume in your kettle from the get-go, which means that uh, you're going to get a better efficiency out of your grain bill. So two ways to do this. The first way is uh, you either um, – well, you, you start with more grains and you just – over sparge it so to speak make sure you get all the volume and all the sugars out of all those grains that you possibly can and then just boil that down to volume then when you get down within let's say for a five gallon batch or a 19 liter batch when you get down with uh within a gallon of your final target volume that's when you start your timer and start adding your hops and go back to the back end so you don't focus too much on the overall time of the boil you just focus on getting that uh, that density down yep um yeah. the second and the way that i like to do it if i can and so I'll actually work out a bigger batch at the same time, and I will take the most concentrated section of that bigger batch uh, and use that for my small batch high alcohol beer 
and the rest of it I'll just sparge out into a low alcohol. Like let's say I'm doing a 31 gallon beer, a one barrel. Uh, I'll do a lower alcohol one barrel and I'll boil down eight gallons of the super concentrated stuff from that mash mm-hmm. for my five gallon. So all of our home brewers that, that are watching us right now, I'm sure they're on 31 gallon systems too. You know, um, if you got friends, you can make it happen. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so what Peter's talking about is a uh, party gal style um, of brewing, which is great. Uh, and, and I've done it several times myself with great results, especially with lighter worts. Um, I have noticed if I'm doing something like um, a big old Russian Imperial stout where you got loads and loads of dark stuff in there. Um, if you don't have a way to separate that out, a lot of times that second runnings um, will end up being pretty tannic. So you might have to try to boost it with, with something a little sweeter to balance it or just kind of be careful with your sparge water. Yeah, I'd be tasting it. And if you start ripping out those tannins, you, you just know. Uh, if you have, uh, if you're good with water chemistry and if you do pre acidify your um, sparge water and or your mash, you can avoid a lot of that tannic uh, pull. Yeah. Um, and then another note on doing any party guile or really any high ABV um, mash is that um, always expect a lower efficiency in your beer regardless. You know, you're, while you might be hitting 70, 75% brew house efficiencies pretty regularly on your, on your 6 or 7% alcohol beers, um, you definitely need to figure that that is going to take a significant hit um, when you're brewing a beer that's 10, 12, 13% alcohol. Um, a lot of times I'll even drop my efficiencies down closer to like 50% just because you're literally cutting your runnings off at some gravity like 1040 or 1050. Yeah, it's, yeah at some point you got to realize that you're diluting that so much that it's going to be really hard to boil it down to the concentration you want, which is why I like the party guile style because yep. then you just get the full extra beer and you got your small really concentrated worth that you can work with. So, yep, definitely figure some pretty low efficiencies. You know, that's why you figure for even a 10 or 11% beer. You're probably going to be looking at a 25-pound uh, a grain bill or somewhere in that range. Yep. It should be fun. Hey, but if you get two beers off of it, that's like two beers for the work of one. That's true. That's uh, very true. Let's talk about times that you don't want a long boil time and times that uh, you still want to get that alcohol up uh, without basically using 25 pounds of grain. And that way I just usually recommend cheating on. Yeah, you uh, kind of have to. Uh, so, yep, generally adding – Thinking um, some, Belgian beers uh, some, in particular. Some degree of highly fermentable sugars. Um, be it if you're making a you know big old double triple IPA in the nine percent range, that might be as simple as adding a pound or two of corn sugar. If you are brewing a Belgian, obviously you're going to be doing your ca- Belgian mm-hmm. candy sugars, which are, are also highly fermentable. Yep, and um, you can also supplement those with some table sugar. A lot of times, neutral table sugar is beet sugar, anyways. So yep, you can use actual beet sugar as actual well. Actual beet sugar, yeah. And uh, and then also honey is another uh, great thing to throw in there too. And honey, depending yep. on the beer, can add a, a nice characteristic to it as well. So uh, well, there's a bunch of different ways to do that, but uh, when you're doing high alcohol beers, especially this way where you're not getting a lot of your fermentables from grain, which yeast really like to eat those things, uh, it's really important that you're doing things like add yeast nutrient. And then I even like to... If it's a Belgian or lighter style beer, I won't add these sugars during the boil. I'll actually try to find a way to add them during fermentation. Um, and two-thirds sugar depletion is kind of the go-to when you add that sugar. Yeah, right as that Krausen sort of like at high or, or starting to drop off depending on your fermenter. Yeah, the reason being if you have too much simple sugars in your beer before – uh, the, bef- at the very beginning, the yeast will go for the simple sugars first, and then it's a lot harder for them to go up to the more complex sugars. Yeah. So they won't uh, they won't eat as much, and a lot of times you can end up with stalling. Yep. Um, <laughs> also, you know, just like any beer, oxidization <coughs> or not oxidization, um, oxygenation um, at the yep. beginning of your fermentation is going to be key. Um, these guys, you know, I I'm sure the sh- there's a lot of people that are just shaking up their carboys or whatever, but um, I really recommend getting some pure O2. Yeah, um, it's a it, huge difference. It makes it, it makes it simpler, makes it faster, and you get a lot more oxygen um, that's dissolved in solution. So, you know, hit it with about 60 seconds of, of pure O2 with a little little carb stone on there, and uh, you'll be much better off. And if you're trying to get into that 13, 14, that really high percentage range, you really have to do some coaxing. Uh, if it's in a conical bottom, this is pretty easy to do. What we'll do is we'll plug our oxygen in at the bottom of the cone, and we'll actually... Uh, add oxygen at the same time as we're rousing the yeast. And so we're kicking that yeast back up into suspension, making sure it doesn't get lazy on us, and we're uh, we're giving it more oxygen so it can multiply and breed more yeast. Yep. Uh, and you can do this up until a few days into fermentation. Uh, as long as you're, uh, you got a lot of active fermentation left to go, uh, about, you know, about two-thirds of your active fermentation left to go, usually you can still be kicking oxygen into that yeast without risking any uh, uh, 
bad side of oxidation effects. Yep. Uh, speaking of yeast, I think that is another thing to definitely always keep in mind. Um, not just yeast health and you know pitch rates; those obviously you want to big bump old up. starter, yeah. Um, but also, really, you know, think about your strains. There's, there's honestly, there's only a, a small handful of strains I can think of that um, that really can tolerate those 12 to 13 percent alcohol conditions. There's a lot of strains um, that like to be lazy on you. Yeah, and, and this is probably the one situation where I would say, when in doubt, go with the Chico strain. Yeah. Um, it tends to do really, really well. Um, but also uh, the Pac-Man strain from from Rogue, which is the yep. joystick. Irish Ale um, is a pretty good one. And Irish Ale um, work. Irish Ale will definitely not ferment as clean, though, yep. at those higher temps. So that's probably something you got to kind of think about, plan your recipe around. But, yeah, don't be throwing, like, a poor old, like, um, you know, house or, like, SO4 yeah. at something like that. It's really going to struggle finishing out for you. Yeah. Or London ESB would be another one. That one's a notorious sleeper. Yep. Um, for Belgians, Trappist High Gravity is a, a clear go-to. And you can also two-stage pitch, meaning you start with whatever flavor profile yeast you want, and then halfway through fermentation, you add a big old starter or whatever really strong finisher you want. Yep. Um, so, let's see. I think that pretty much – is that it for high gravity beers? Um, Any other tips? Um, oh, I guess post-fermentation. Yeah. Um, post-fermentation – these beers are also going to need to be aged regardless of what you're brewing. Um, this can vary anywhere from maybe a few months to actually a few years. Uh, my rule of thumb for high gravity beers is that uh, the higher the alcohol is, the longer you're going to age it. Um, so yeah, that's just something to, to keep in mind as well. Um, most of these beers do fantastic when it comes to adding oak to as well because they're typically going to be big sweet bodied beer to begin with. So uh, any kind of like a, a slightly tannic oak characteristic to them can uh, actually be more of a benefit than a detriment. Plus the alcohol actually helps absorb the oak a little bit better. Um, somebody also mentioned temperature control. Uh, the one thing that I would say when it comes to temperature control, and I didn't read it too much, uh, but uh, is if you are uh, if you're p doing a really big pitch, I like to err on the side of the lower temperature at the beginning of fermentation and just play around with a lot of coaxing, a lot of like getting that yeast back up in suspension and reoxygenating in the first couple days. And then towards the end of fermentation, I like to make sure it has time at that higher temperature just to make sure that it's got enough energy in there to really finish out that beer. Yeah. And then if you want a bottle condition, look at that. I happen to have one right behind me. Yeah. Boom, right there. Uh, that is actually a fantastic yeast. <coughs> I have used this to bottle condition um, an 11.5% beer, uh, and it was pretty impressive that it works so well. So yeah. um, CBC-1 actually designed for that kind of stuff. Turns out can handle the alcohol. Um, and yeah, and I think that pretty much is it for the high gravity beers. And I know Peter was already talking about fermentation, so let's just jump right into that. Temperature control, fermentation. Yeah, so um, that's that's probably the hardest thing as a home brewer. I know in my years I have struggled with it um, time and time again, and that is finding the right temperature um, to ferment your beers at and, you know, seasonally. Um, summertime, obviously, in our climate, varies widely from the winter time. Where the winter time, you're like, oh man, it's really cold. In the summertime, you're like, uh oh, 80 degrees. That's not good. So we all know that fermentation temperature control is really important. But a lot of you don't have things like we have, where the, you know, glycol chillers and heaters, and you know, we'll even run uh, use our, ma our mash and boil to heat up water and run that through the glycol jackets to make sure that we can, you know, get our temperatures up if we need to. But uh, what we want to talk about is temperature control at home. And uh, there is actually a lot of hacks to do this. Um, <clears throat> you know, generally speaking, heating is going to be a lot easier than cooling. Um, so as for, for heating, what I just say, you know, have a heated space, I guess, if you need to keep things warm. And or just, you know, choose a yeast strain that's going to ferment better in the cold temperatures. You know, there, we have a handful here. Um, they'll work just fine for you. <laughs> Um, but also, yeah, we do have little firm wraps as well is another option. You can hook those up to an ink bird. Um, they'll actually heat a beer, you know, a five-gallon batch of beer at least 15 degrees above ambient. So, yeah, we um, accidentally got one up above 100 degrees once. Yeah. Hey, but the beer turned out well, and that's all that matters. <laughs> so, yeah, firm wraps, throw in a heater, pretty straightforward, you know, unless you're, and yeah, unless you're, like, got a beer out side or something in the wintertime and you're trying to do a Belgian Saison at 
85 degrees. Yeah. What we degrees. usually say to start off with before we get into actual control is that it's best to pick a yeast that fits your temperature. So if it's really hot where you are, you can still keep your beer in a dark place. Use the Quike yeast or use a Belgian or brew Belgian beers. Um, Quike is really good at being relatively neutral and clean at a hot temperature and has the added bonus of not having to have a very large pitch rate. Uh, if you're going to be fermenting on the cold side, then you might need to go with a, a, a strain that can ferment really well on the cold side, depending on what flavor you want to. Cow lager comes to mind. That's got a really wide temperature range. Um, any sort of lager, obviously, on the cold side. But also things like the Scottish Ale we were talking about earlier. Um, but when it comes to actually control, uh, things that you can do to hack that control is really focus in on dialing in the ambient temperature and estimating that during volatile fermentation, your beer is going to be two to three degrees above that. Yeah. And uh, during non-volatile fermentation, you should kind of find a homeostasis. Yeah, I've even seen a five-degree free rise actually out of a out of a five-gallon <coughs> cardboard. It's got to be pretty active though. Yeah, that's with uh, the good old 1007 yeast, which is another yep. one that can actually ferment on the cold side. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So and then also learning your house. You know, yeah, it's it's easy to throw firm wraps on there too, but. Um, you know, my house, different parts of my house are different temperatures at different times of the year. Um, a lot of times, you know, if I am trying to do a true lager, I'll actually throw it under my house. In fact, I'll actually ferment um, ales under my house in the summertime because I know that during the summer that stays, you know, relatively cool down in the mid 60s, whereas in the wintertime it's sitting about 40. Um, and then my back bedroom uh, in the winter will generally be, you know, 60, 65. So sort of seek out some closets in your house, seek out some some dark spot places that are out of the way um, and just sort of pay attention to what the ambient temperature is going to be. And then, like Peter said, you know, find a yeast strain that's going to uh, work well in those situations. So we did say that we were going to go with some temperature control hacks. So things that I know that can help you stay at a more appropriate temperature. Um, just thinking off the top of my head, I haven't tried this, but I've heard that you can use a sous vide for on the warmth for warming up to your temperature. So yeah, um, a lot of you probably already have a little you know sous vide maker thing or some some little temperature controlled uh, um, heating element that you can stick in water. And so if you want to go that method, you can literally take your fermenter, stick it in a small bucket of water, and put your your sous vide maker in there and sous vide some beer up. Why not, right? Um, so going on the opposite side of that, um, sort of using the same method as with, with a bucket or a pail of water that you have your fermenter in, um, if you actually want to cool a beer down, um, you can use that bucket of water um, and then actually take a, a towel or a t-shirt. I like t-shirt, t-shirt yeah. yeah. a lot of people do a t-shirt, um, something that actually help with light too because a lot of times that won't be in a dark yeah. spot. Um, and, and actually let that wick the water up over the t-shirt as that evaporates. It pulls off heat and will actually cool your beer down um, a, a surprising good amount. amount. Yeah. yeah, like like six, seven degrees Fahrenheit. If you put a fan right next to it, that works even it'll better because be, yeah, you're be, really re, uh, getting that evaporation up. Yep. So. so if you got kind of a warmer spot, say it's summertime and you don't have you know air conditioning in your house. You and ferment a nice cool beer. Yeah, you got yeah. 80 degree ambient temps, then definitely go with the t-shirt method. I if you're using a cardboard, the t-shirt fits like right over it too. Yeah. It's like it's perfect. Yeah, except for your t-shirts because you're – yeah, if you're using two carboys, my T-shirts fit over them. <laughs> it's not my fault. I'm a giant. Um, and then, yeah, I think uh, lastly is, you know, just uh, I, I know that they make some products out there with you can you can actually pack ice in, too, to mm. cool, which, you know, I'm sure you can you can hack that as well. Um, but, yeah, um, blankets, um, another simple thing to keep keep a beer warm. R- electric blankets. Uh, electric blankets as well. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of things you, you're going to have around your house that you can use to do this. Yeah. So if you've got any other additional temperature control hacks, let us know. Um, I'm sure we forgot some, but also we were kind of chaotic this morning trying to get everything set up. Uh, yeah, I think it's time, it's time to go on to some questions and answers. Sounds good. Yeah, it is. Thanks, Logan. Oh, yeah. man, we're on the same page. I'm writing down some questions here. Okay, well, let's uh, – uh, I know there was some further up, so I'll just kind of start at the top and then work our way down. Look at – oh, there's a lot of comments today. Yeah. Maple syrup. Got sand only in one ear. We got that fixed. Noise. What should you do if you can't control the fermenting temperature? Like me, blonde, uh, blonde high-alcohol beers seem difficult. Stouts masking the flavors. Fine, I think. Oh, yeah, so if you're trying to get – uh, if you can't control the fermenting temperature, like me, I would say pick a yeast that is uh, is very neutral on a wider range. And then also uh, the hack that we just told you about the t-shirt, like trying to keep it on the cold end. So air on the side of getting it cold and then make sure that you have 
a yeast that can go extra cold beyond where you have. Um, that said, it's still going to take some coaxing, so don't be afraid to like yeah. give your carb away and I swish a, a day or two into fermentation to make sure that it's like really fermenting healthily and new. Uh, and then, as always, do a huge yeast starter. I was going to say that that's the other thing is is actually um, it sounds weird, but a higher <coughs> pitch rate. Um, will actually keep the beer cleaner at a warmer temperature, even though it'll seem like it's fermenting really, really vigorously because those yeast are actually dividing less. Um, and a lot of times it comes through those divisions that the yeast are actually throwing off those unwanted flavors. Yeah. Um, so uh, Best beer channel on YouTube. Hey, thanks. I appreciate that. Damn, yeah. But otherwise, yeah, pitch high. Um, yeah, bl- pick a yeast strain. Um, 3470 when in doubt. Um, use the the vine stuff in lager strain um, ferments super clean even at like 80 degrees what sort of percentage is a pound in a typical batch doesn't have much meaning to us metric yeah we know uh, that pounds don't have a ton of meaning um, we use we use weights a lot of times over uh, percentages just because they, they scale so differently with high and low percentage beers and so there's times especially in low percentage beers that we'll think that um, using an actual weight makes more sense than using percentages because, you know, if we say uh, a pound in uh, a beer, if it's something like that Scotch Ale where it's a 3.2% beer, that's yeah, like we're 20%, talking, percent, yeah. 30%. Like <laughs> it's, you know, it's a lot more versus a normal percentage beer where it's like half that. Talking so, 30% adjuncts here. Yeah. Um, so sometimes we'll use just raw amounts because that flavor is going to directly impact your final beer, and sometimes we'll use percentages. We try to remember to use metric when we can, but – also, we think American because that's how our elementary schools taught us. Bam. Well, we know the error angle percentage helps you understand recipes more. Try you need that pen it. anyway. Pens. Um, how do you know if the yeast is done cleaning up off flavors? we got a couple people that already answer, answered that. Um, yeah, when in doubt, wait. Just give it extra time. Um, the, yeah. the yeast will give you clear signs that it's pretty much done fermenting. It'll start to fall asleep and go to the bottom of the, of the fermenter. Um, but the best way to do it is to, is to just taste and see where it's at. Yeah. Um, if you, if you <coughs> taste um, any kind of diacetyl in there, give it more time. Um, a lot of times for hot forward beers, for me, um, I like to call it sort of this orange rind um, flavor profile to, to a, you know, typically like West Coast hopped um, beer. And that's usually a pretty good indicator that that beer is still green to me. Um, I know some people will like that, but that's that actually means that the yeast is still in there. It's still cleaning things up. Yep. Um, yeah, but like when in, when in doubt, give it extra time. Although yep. if you're in an IPA, you kind of you know you kind of gotta rush it a little bit. But yeah, if you have some sort of a sample port, that's the best way to always be able to take samples. Corn sugar, dextrose, yes, that's that is the same thing. Yeah, I don't <laughs> know if you're asking if they're the same thing or if you're asking if that's the best way to add to brew a high alcohol beer. I'm trying to forget, remember where we're in that. But, uh, yeah, we use uh, dextrose for um, a lot of IPAs. I think it just makes a really clean, higher alcohol beer without having to add more grain that will kind of compete with the hop flavor. Yeah. Um, somebody's asking about if the online calculators are actually accurate for efficiencies. And, um, yes, they are if you use them properly. Um, the, the main thing to note there is that there is a big difference between um, – kettle efficiency and brew house efficiency yeah um, which brew house efficiency um, has to do with the actual um, wort going into your fermenter and whether or not you are measuring that wort accurately um, when it comes to actually getting the the gravity for one but also the actual volume Um, obviously if you leave a half gallon of of wort in your kettle um, and are measuring it in your kettle versus your fermenter that's going to have a pretty big impact on your efficiency um, with that said, um, if you're getting 90%, that is possible. I've never gotten that myself. I think I've gotten, um, I think the best I've ever done for a brew house was like 85%, and that's going to generally be on on very low alcohol beers. Um, but usually you're going to be looking at that sort of 70 to 80% mark. And it's really important to take volume into account, and people don't uh, often do that. They, you know, I've I've had I literally had a customer one time that came in and was like, I just got 110 percent efficiency on my beer. <laughs> yeah. I only got four gallons off of it, and I was trying to do six. But and I'm like, ah, I hate to break it to you, but those those two kind of <laughs> go hand in hand. And it doesn't work that way because yeah. yeah. So um, efficiencies in general are calculated by the potential total sugars in your grains that you're using. Yeah. Um. So. So, yeah, if you're getting 100%, it means that you literally washed out every bit of sugar. Your final runnings were at a 0. Point, or 1.000 gravity. And you lost zero to hops. Yeah, and you lost zero to hops. <laughs> so it's, 
Um, yeah, so that's why 90 is pretty unprecedented unless you have um, very, very high-end commercial brewing equipment that you know squeezes stuff and gets weird on, on things like that. It is, it, so. is, it is possible, but uh, at the same time, you've got to take all those things into account, and you've got to know you have the difference between brew house and cattle efficiency. Um, and there are systems, though, that will get that, that high of efficiency, but what they're doing is they're grinding their, their grain into powder, uh, like true powder. Uh, yeah. We did a video on that once, actually. Uh, and then they have a way to squeeze every last bit of moisture out of all that grain, like a really high-powered yeah. hydraulic squeezer. Uh, and then with their hops and everything like that, they do the same thing, but they run it through a series filter. And so they're getting all the hop material out completely dry in one big lump brick, yeah. and then all the beer ends up in the back end. So they're saving all their money on that super expensive equipment by getting all the beer they possibly can out of their grains and hops. Yeah, not something that's probably going to be worth your time and or money for um, a five-gallon scale. Yeah, <laughs> unless you're doing like 100 barrels. it's uh, Even at 100 barrels, I think it's probably... No, yeah. Um, 12 days Bam. of three weeks, slow bubbling. People keep yelling, quack. Quack! We nailed it. Um, room temperature stuff. I sure wonder if I can make the temperature difference. Only temperature makes so much difference. Yeah, I, honestly, water baths are probably the best way to keep a consistent temperature uh, for pretty much any use just because water is, first of all, it evaporates, and so it's always slightly colder than room temperature. And second of all, um, it's it's got it can hold a lot of heat. And so if you're struggling for um, ways to temperature control on the cold end at least, uh, water baths are kind of some of the best ways, even if you're just using your bathtub. Um, Count Druncula is asking about measuring gravity during fermentation. Um, a lot of times we are spoiled here because our larger tanks have sample ports that we can pull a sample off without adding any oxi um, oxygen in there. Um, but on a homebrew scale, it's definitely going to be trickier. I honestly just recommend letting it ride, um, not worrying about it until that fermentation is done. Um, that's really the best way to do it. I know, I know it's tempting to get in there and, and pull samples, but try to avoid it whenever you can. Um, unless you got a fancy piece of equipment like, you know, the little $400 conical that, that we got here that has sample ports and stuff like that on it. Yeah, or like a brew bug, one of those things that you, it monitors temperature control during fermentation just by being a little electronic probe that's inside there. Yeah. So. Or gravity, that's what I meant. Bam. Um, paid for it because you can't control temperature all... That bubbling can be due to temperature changes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, actually, you know, one hack would be um, if you do have um, a kegging system, you have a, a CO2 tank, because um, he was also talking about uh, the airlock, how it would suck back in yeah. when he would pull a gravity sample. Um, you can actually take a small piece of silicone tube and stick it in your airlock, open up your CO2, and actually back, back purge that with CO2. That is something that um, we do pretty frequently here. Um, in fact, what I, we pulled a couple of the um, SS BrewTech brew buckets to use um, for some of our experimental batches. And what I'll actually do when I go to transfer those is I will pull off the airlock and then actually stick the, the tube right in there. We have a piece of silicone that fits really nicely in there and hit it with CO2 so that I constantly have positive pressure on that while I'm transferring. Um, someone's asking, have we tried presser fermentation as an alternate to temperature control? Are both necessary still? What are your thoughts on it? Uh, we almost always do a relatively open fermentation or a, a fermentation that's got a uh, blow-off tube. Uh, what we will do sometimes is we will spund for different effects. I think that helps keep hop character in there. Uh, but spunding for a, u for a neutral beer uh, as a substitute for temperature control, I prefer temperature control um, mostly because uh, how – yeasts act to different temperatures is something we're pretty familiar with how yeasts act to different pressures is not uh, we haven't we've played with all the yeasts but we haven't played with all of them under pressure and they will act very very differently yeah. so some yeasts will be really neutral to pressure and some yeasts will not yeah um, some, some yeast will die or i was not gonna die, say we, we've had a couple where yeah we we start pressurizing tanks um, before the fermentation's done those yeast really do not respond well to it um, it really slowed down the fermentation for us so Something that uh, I wish I could tell you more about, but yeah, we just sort of have mixed results from it. Um, with that said, I mean, for a big hazy IPA, as long as you got a good healthy yeast pitch, I don't see it hurting anything. Yeah, um, yeah we almost always, basically we'll usually spund at, uh, uh, right after high krausen when we, when we dry hop, basically. Um, we'll 
open it up, dry hop, we'll add CO2 in through the bottom, close everything off, uh, and then let it finish out fermentation under pressure, which saves us a ton in CO2. Uh, but again, it's not a whole, the entire batch isn't done under pressure. So we don't have a spunding valve where we can like nail in. We want a 12 PSI this batch. Um, what else? Tonka beans to a porter. Don't know what tonka beans are. Me neither. That's a new one for me. That sounds fun. 90% pale, 20% crystal. What's the weight batch size? Like you guys say, crystal malts don't belong in IPAs. Why is that? Oh, yeah. Crystal malts. So uh, a big part of that, why we say crystal malts don't belong in IPAs, comes from a lot of the IPAs we can get around here. Um, Northwest style IPAs are, the, you know, that classic style of IPA. It's not a classic style, but it's taken off of the English style where crystal malts actually are in IPAs. But uh, in, in Washington and the West Coast of the United States, we have access to phenomenally explosive and dynamic hops. Uh, the hop capital of the world is Yakima. That's a solid two-hour drive from here. And uh, because of that, a lot of times people will try to use a lot of these big new hops and then they'll also add crystal malt, which can be distracting. Now, um, basically, our general tenet on why crystal malts don't belong in IPAs is because they're unnecessary. They don't add anything positive. They don't always take away from the beer's experience, but they don't add anything positive. Uh, and you can get the same flavors that you're looking for in crystal malts different ways without risking, which some people do, going overboard with the crystal malts and making a beer that's weirdly sweet and doesn't blend in well with the hops. Yeah. And so we almost okay. always go the other way. Yeah, a lot of the big New World hops, um, they're and the way we use them, I should say, as well, um, you get a lot of actual like um, pseudo sweetness from them. You, you're not getting bitterness from them, and so when you add them with other sweet um, specialty malts, um, they sort of just double up on each other and end up getting a little bit weird, and uh, yeah, just compete with each other's flavor profiles. Uh, have we experimented with quite yeast strains, either isolates or in the community culture farmhouse? Uh, we've done one, the the two quikes that we've used. Uh, we have a dry pitch of the Hornet all somewhere, but the, the ones that we've used are Loki from Imperial, and then uh, Imperial also came out with a blend, which was, um, I forget which strain Loki is, uh, but it's a they're, they're uh, quiking, which was a seasonal that they did. They blend the Hornet all strain in with whatever strain Loki is with another strain. Um, those are the two we've played with. They do ferment very nicely. Um, very clean, actually, Loki specifically. At Loki's low super clean. Yeah, at low temperatures, at high temperatures, I just... Um, it's actually not crazy, crazy, like, funky. Um, it's a little you, orangey. Yeah, you get oranginess from it is the best way I can describe that. Um, the the mixed strains, um, I think the Hornet All strain is definitely a little bit more farmhousey. Um, got a little more funk to it, so. Um, bam. Fishing and double grinding my grain and getting nice looks large and heat efficiency. Right. Uh, flour. Oh, can you explain more about you brewing with floured malts? Oh, interesting. Um so yeah, uh, flour malts, that's uh, something that you're using on the on big, big commercial scales, and they have the, um, I think the, uh, the ability to do that. I think the example would be Full Sail. Full Sail, yeah, yes. they have a huge system where they, they <laughs> basically powder their- 600 barrel batches. Yeah. Yeah. On, on the small scale, it's very, very difficult. We did do a beer with uh, flour malts just to kind of see if we could debunk whether or not that would give extra tannins because you're kind of exposing as much yeah. as possible of crushed holes in there. Uh, and the beer turned out really, really well. Um, I would say the number one thing you would do if you use floured malts is try to have a really good filtration system on the back end before going into fermentation. Yeah, or you won't you won't have your traditional mash tun. Um, I think yeah. we did it with like a brew in a bag method, um, and it was. But we tried to squeeze as much out possible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we got low efficiency off of it when it was all said and done. But uh, but yeah, I mean it's you'd have to have a very different system in order to do it. With that said. If you got your system dialed in, I think it could work for you. Yeah, I think the best way to do it if you're trying to do it on a home scale is find a way to uh, do your regular mash and then have a filtration system going into your boil kettle. Uh, just get as much of that out of there as possible before you go uh, boiling. Taking gravity readings has been an issue for me lately. I take temperatures with the samples, but my hydrometer and refractometer are quite often very far apart. Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you should be uh, able to... Um, take a basically calibration measurement so use di water on both your refractometer and your hydrometers and using di water you should be able to get uh, something pretty dialed in uh, make sure that your refractometer is atc as well um, that'll make a huge difference uh, your hydrometer will never be atc automatic temperature yeah changing yeah um, so make sure you, you know what temperature your hydrometers are meant to be at usually it's right around 70 degrees fahrenheit uh, and then also make sure you're using an ATC refractometer because that's 
why you use them because they're really good on the hot end. Yeah, I personally have actually gone away from refractometers myself. Um, while they're good to get an idea of where you're at, um, they are notorious for actually being thrown off calibration due to ambient air temperature. Um, a lot of times if you're brewing outside and you got a cold morning, you might take a sample and then as it heats up in the afternoon, you actually have to recalibrate those and most people don't realize that. So um, me, I'm kind of this, just a good old hydrometer fan. Um, try to try to cool off my word a little bit before it goes in, but then you, the uh, there's some online calculators that'll actually um, do a temperature adjustments for you, and I've personal ex experiences that uh, those are very accurate. Yeah, and also refractometers, uh, there is a way to calculate, but they don't work with alcohol present because alcohol has a different refraction rating. Another very good note. Yes, you have to buy a very very expensive one if you have uh, if you have actual alcohol in there. So. Brewing a beer to garden next week using Weiss French Saison. Should I be concerned over attenuation since it's a diastatic variant? Uh, uh, I diastatic mean, variant? I don't. Uh, it's going to tear through that thing if that's what you're asking. Um, yeah, no, French Saison is always going to finish really low. Um, it will attenuate low, um, but I wouldn't it'll, really worry It'll finish about out at a normal uh, at final gravity, but then if you bottle condition it, it will continue to... Yeah. to go so it'll finish out it'll look pretty normal um, it doesn't produce those enzymes very f as fast as other diastatic variants like uh well the best example i have is when we use that whiskey yeast for a brute ipa yeah um but uh at the same time uh if you're bottle conditioning it which i would with the beer to guard uh you're gonna get you, know, you just know you're gonna get those bottle bombs two years down the road which is i mean that's part in, in my mind that's part of the experience when you're doing a beer to guard like a well-aged beer to guard if you're opening that that should have that very champagne of, that extra fizziness yep. um what's the best hop combination for west ipa pretty simple columbus chinook and one super fruity hop pretty much those three combined and you're good to go uh just noticed a stream quick question how do you guys get the peach esters from uso5 i fermented uh at 15 celsius for a while we'll bottle next thursday hoping for some uh i haven't gotten a ton of peach esters from uso5 but i would say our normal r routine with using uso5 is we start at a pretty yeah. medium low temperature for four or five days uh for uh, it's i'm not sure what it is in celsius but it's about 65 degrees fahrenheit uh and then we'll go ahead and within that four or five days when we notice the crowds and starting to starting to drop we'll bump that up uh, all the way up to maybe even 72 73 yeah 15 yeah. seems pretty dang cold honestly um, we can but, figure uh, it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah. O five probably wouldn't be the best strain. Um, I would actually go honestly like the, uh, strain. I think we talked about last year, the, uh, the American L two would be oh, a yeah, little bit pretty, better. That cold. Um, um, yeah, I would say just during fermentation, make sure that you're bumping that up to what's that 20, 23, 23, 22 degrees Celsius. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Get fermented on the hot side. That's how you're going to get more of that peachiness from it. Um, if anything, yeah. also using you know some some peachy hops. I know there's a lot of brand new experimental hop varieties out there that uh, sort of have peach characteristics to them. Yeah. Um, God, what's the one that I actually used for Kolsch that was kind of peachy? Um, it was. I'm going to process this. You can talk about it. Well, on that note, we are going to start opening up. Thank you guys for tuning in while he processes that. Maybe you'll be able to shout it out at the last minute before we get this thing closed up. Uh, we do this live stream every single Sunday, and we try to aim for 845 start time. That's Pacific Standard Time. So uh, um, are you all the guys who have a video on how to make a solenoid valve for temperature control? Uh, we did do that, yeah, actually. we did a video. Yeah, that was a while ago for uh, with our glycol chiller, and we uh, I think we Amazon linked the solenoid that we used. Um, but anyways, we got to get mopping. We got to get opened up. I can't uh, remember the yeast or the hop strain either. Sorry for the late start. <laughs> Tonka beans from Brazil, flower and aroma, clove and vanilla. Ooh. Okay. So Challenge, Challenge accepted. Someone oh, illegal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> someone Dang it. Send us a Tonka bean. <laughs> we'll smuggle Weesh. it in. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Please, uh, as always, be sure to send us messages on Facebook, Instagram, or on any YouTube video for uh, ideas that you would like to see in the next live stream. This is our only chance every single week to get to talk to you. And so anything that you want to hear about in person or have a back and forth with us on, let us know. All right. See ya. <laughs> that does it. All right. See ya. Bye. Later, Bye. guys. Oh, subscribe, like. Subscribe, live streams, and stream. Boop. <laughs>